The following presentation was recorded at the 2013 Southeast Linux Fest in Charlotte, North Carolina. It is licensed under a Creative Commons license. For more information about the Southeast Linux Fest, visit www.southeastlinuxfest.org. The Southeast Linux Fest would like to thank the following diamond sponsors in 2013 for helping make these videos possible. Great, it's awesome to be uh, here in Charlotte. I live here in Charlotte and it's really exciting to see something like B-Sides come to Charlotte. So uh, thanks to everyone who is, is putting this on and it's a, good, it's a nice turnout. So uh, hope to be back again next year. So today, uh, about an hour here, and I want to speak on mobile device security. And the main things I want to cover are uh, device and platform security overview. I'm going to go over several of the more popular mobile device platforms that are available today. Uh, talk about some of the threat modeling mobile for mobile applications. Uh, cover some of the aspects of a mobile security assessment and security best practices. And also have a couple demos that might be interesting. So uh, I'll start out with an obvious question. How many people in the crowd have at least one mobile device? All right, I think that's pretty much everyone. How many people have two mobile devices? Three mobile devices. Still got hand four mobile devices. Five? Okay, so four mobile devices. So we were talking recently at the Charlotte OWASP chapter meeting about how the mobile devices have really, are, they're taking over the, the PCs or outnumbering them, so to speak, because most people probably have one laptop and a desktop or maybe one for work and one for home. But when it comes to mobile devices, you know, we have multiple phones, maybe one for work, one for home. We have tablets. Uh, we have all different types of devices that are mobile devices. And so it's, it's really kind of changing the landscape of the, from a security standpoint because these are devices that are typically lost or stolen because they're so small they can fit in your pocket or someone else's pocket. You can travel with them, you can easily leave them somewhere. So it kind of changes the landscape from a security standpoint and I want to kind of cover those things today. So just real quick about, about the company that I work for. We're called Gotham Digital Science. We uh, are a consulting firm that primarily focuses on software security. That's really what our passion is and uh, really you know, kind of a, the bread and butter. Uh, we're, we're founded in 2005 and, and we're headquartered in New York City. We also have an office in London and we have a local team here in Charlotte as well that we're growing. Uh, the primary services that we offer are black box mobile testing and web testing, security code reviews, secure development training and secure, develop, uh, secure design and architecture reviews. And we're also uh, really pride ourselves on a lot of research and development. If you check out our blog, and our tool section is fairly active and we try to get out and speak at conferences such as B-Sides and even some larger conferences such as ShmooCon, Black Hat and so forth. So let's jump right in, talk about some OS's here. Uh, this is a recent, uh, some recent data that I pulled for mobile OS market share forecast for 2014. And you'll look here that uh, Symbian, which is if you're not familiar with Simeon, just think about flip phones and a lot of those types of phones that you get, usually the free ones that you get at uh, Verizon or AT&T. Those are Symbian phones and they still have a quite a market share. Uh, after that you have Android, which is second in, market, in the market, and then iOS, 15%, and then RIM, which is Blackberry, uh, which is 12%. When it comes to store sizes, all of these applications, or all, the, all of these OSs have a fairly mature store at this point. And the ones I wanted to point out are the, the Windows Mobile Store is 120,000 apps. Android has 500,000 apps. Research in Motion has roughly 100,000 apps. And then iOS has a, a, quite a lead with uh, over a million apps. So the operating systems we're going to talk about today are uh, the, the Apple iOS operating system for iPhones and uh, iPads and iPad Touches, iPod Touches. Uh, Android and Blackberry. So first we're going to start with iOS. Uh, just an overview of it real quick. Uh, it's based on Mac OS X. It's very similar to that so it shares a lot of the same security characteristics. It runs on an iPhone, an iPod Touch, or an iPad. Uh, some additional restrictions on iOS are that the, uh, the application has access to the files and system resources or that they're restricted. And uh, in the beginning, only one application could run at a time. But as of iOS 4, you can actually have applications running in the background. 
So in iOS 4, they also introduced uh, support for hardware encryption on the device, which is 256-bit AES. And it's meant basically to allow fast uh, remote wipe. And the way that it works is that there's a symmetric key. And the key is set whenever you set a password on the device. And whenever you wipe it, the way this works, the way it's so fast is it, it doesn't delete the data itself. It actually just deletes one of the symmetric keys. So you would have to have both keys. So if it deletes the key, you can't actually access the data. So it's not really intended to protect, to pr protect the application data. That's, that's one of the key things here. So they also introduced something called the Data Protection API. And, and basically what this is, is, it's an additional layer on top of the hardware encryption. And it, it was introduced in iOS 4, and it's, it's still available in later versions as well. So as I mentioned, the way that it works is that when a, a user sets a password on their device, uh, it uses that password to create the, the, encryption, uh, the encryption key. And then it uses that whenever you log into the device to actually decrypt it. So a question to the crowd. So let's say that you have a device you have data protection enabled, and you've lost your iPhone. Do you think all of your data is safe? Show of hands, how many people think that the data is safe? Smart crowd. <laughs> the answer is no. The reason is that the applications have to leverage the data protection API. So it's really up to the developer to leverage the API that's provided by Apple before the data is actually encrypted when, they're using, when, the, when the user enables the passcode. Uh, another thing to point out, and I'll go over some of the iOS applications that are built in that, that don't leverage this or don't have this feature built in, but a lot of the built-in features or apps and features, so to speak, don't really use the API, so those are also at risk. So here's a list. Um, hopefully you can see those there. So just a couple to, to list off here. These are just a number of, of random apps that would be running on a device. Uh, you've got like AOL email, Apple Push, CalDAV, uh, LDAP. If you see here uh, where it says protected in the accessibility column, the darker column there, if it says protected there, then those are actually leveraging the data protection API. If not, then, then it's not. And I wanted to point out a couple of them that really kind of drew, you know, grabbed my attention is, is the VPN. There's three VPN applications on here that don't leverage the, uh, the data protection API. So when that data gets stored to the keychain, and we'll talk about this a little further in a minute, that data is not actually encrypted. Uh, it's, it's stored in plain text. Some examples of built-in apps that are stored in unprotected are text messages, contacts, photos, and, and web history. So the keychain, if you have a Mac, you may be familiar with the, what the keychain is. Uh, it's very, very similar on iOS, and it's basically a password-protected database that provides secure encrypted storage for passwords and other secrets on the device. So iOS permits the application itself that set the data and put the data in the keychain only that application can access that data from the keychain. So it's sandboxed in that from that perspective. Uh, the keychain, sort of industry-wide, is, is the recommended storage medium on iOS for storing secrets. And um, one thing, as I mentioned earlier, it's up to the developer to leverage the API to begin with before the data is encrypted by, for their application. So most users who own a, an, an Apple device uh, will routinely perform a backup of that, and they can do that through iTunes. And I have kind of a screenshot here of what it looks like where you have the opportunity to set a password, and that encrypts the backup itself. However, it's important to, to point out that that's not something that's enabled by default. There's actually a little checkbox. You can see, potentially, you see it here circled, where the user, it's up to the user to encrypt it whenever they have the backup, so whenever they back up the device. So if they back up the device and they don't check that box, that means that all of their data they're backing up to their system is actually being stored on their local hard drive unencrypted. And we'll talk a little bit about that in a little while, and I have a demo that kind of points out um, how an attacker could obtain that data. So first of all, I want to uh, kind of hop out of the presentation here, and I want to go through a, uh, a jailbroken device demo that I have here. It's pre-recorded. And basically, we have an iPad here. Uh, 
So first of all, what we're going to do is the jailbroken iPad, and we're going to SSH into this iPad from a local system. And we're basically just going to use PuTTY SSH to do that. Um, we know what the IP is from our local network. This is a little slow, so I'll try to speed it up here a little bit. Basically, we obtain what the IP address is. We're going to type it in over here in PuTTY. Port 22, which is the default SSH port for iOS on the device. Can everyone see that OK? OK. So um, we've logged in here as, as root. We know the password, which is commonly uh, available. Just kind of want to say here, you name uh, what the device is. So we have here the iPad. And first of all, what we're going to do is just take a look at some of the information that's been typed into the keyboard. So uh, we're basically just going to use a strings command and look at the dynamic text.dat file. And you can see some of the information that's been typed into the keyboard on this device, just stored in clear text here. So the next thing we're going to do here, we're going to use a tool that's, that's uh, freely available called Keychain Dumper. And we're going to take a look at the keychain that's stored on the device. And we're just going to go through the keychain, first of all, in an unlocked device mode and look at what sort of data is being stored in the keychain. Now, keep in mind that unlock means the users put the password in and it's leveraging the, da the data API. So that information is going to be stored in, in clear text at this point. So we're just going to scroll through here. You'll see, uh, first of all, there is a Wi-Fi password. Keychain data, wherever it says keychain data, that's the data that's been entered uh, and stored by the application. You'll see that some say not accessible. So here's another uh, Belkin Wi Fi password. Here's an account Mallory and the keychain data, Woot1. So this is, this is on uh, an unlocked device. So now we're going to pop out. We're going to basically go back out, and we're going to lock the device. So it's now locked. Now we're going to go back over to SSH, and we're going to take a look again at the keychain, and we're going to see if any of that data is encrypted. So keep in mind, the data protection API is leveraged at this point. You should see some large blocks of encryption. So you can see um, the difference between the two and how that's stored. And like I said earlier, that's really up to the developers to if they leverage that. And it's highly recommended. OK, so um, as I mentioned earlier, it relies on a password, a uh, four-digit PIN. You can also, uh, in this case, you, you can use a stronger password. Uh, of alphanumeric characters. Uh, from a development standpoint, when you're storing data on the device, you have to assume that the user's not going to enable that. That's not something that you really have control over. So you have to assume that there is going to be a fraction of your users, uh, potentially a large fraction, that don't actually leverage the, uh, don't actually set a passcode on the device. So from an enterprise perspective, iOS, uh, I'll go through these kind of quickly because we have three OSs to cover. Um, but basically, it supports multiple VPN technologies. Um, it has multiple methods for user authentication. That's pre-shared keys, X509 digital certificates, two-factor authentication through RSA Secure ID and CryptoCard. Server-side authentication and authorization has to be implemented by the application developer. And that has to be something that's, that's done server-side and through the code that they write. Uh, the client-side authorization provided by Apple is the application sandbox, and that basically prevents one application from talking to the other application. So the way that you get an iPhone app uh, typically uh, would be to use the Apple App Store. It's the central distribution point. So if you're a developer, you want to get an app, an app to other users, that's the method that you're going to use. You're going you're gonna to upload it to them. All applications have to be digitally signed by Apple before they actually can be loaded on a device. This is a non-jailbroken device, by the way. Um, the approval times can vary from days to weeks. And that has been proven to significantly affect patching on devices. Now, this has improved a lot since iOS was released 
and Apple's gotten a lot better at it, but it's still uh, something that developers should consider. And um, one thing to note, that Apple does perform some limited security testing on your apps, but uh, from a security standpoint, I would not rely on that. Uh, they're mainly just looking uh, just very high level things, not anything specific. They're not digging through your code or doing full blown code reviews or anything like that. So it does make sense in most cases to have a formal code review or a formal black box performed on your, your application. They're basically preventing malware from entering into their app stream. So another um, benefit of the iOS Enterprise uh, solution is, is it supports Microsoft Exchange Active Sync, and some of the policies that are supported by that are password policies, device locked after inactivity. You can disable the camera and the web browser from you know the enterprise level. Uh, you can uh, limit the the maximum age of an email that sits on the device, and you can also perform remote wipes, which is really convenient if someone leaves the company or if a device is lost or something of that nature. There's also mobile device management, which basically provides the ability uh, for a large organization to scalably deploy applications. And this is really nice when you know, you've got one application and you've got 50,000 users and you want to push it out. You can utilize MDM for something like this. It was introduced in iOS 4, and it re does require an MDM server. And um, the device management is performed over the air, so the users do not have to plug the device into their system. And Apple provides an enterprise developer program, and it basically uh, allows an organization to receive one certificate that they can utilize to distribute all of their applications. And um, they can distribute provisioning profiles, and, which can be securely delivered to enrolled devices on, on the network. So let's talk a little bit about Android. That covers iOS. So Android's a little bit of a different beast, where iOS is a, sort of a closed uh, network, or, or basically a closed source mobile operating system. Android is, is open. Um, it runs on a modified Linux kernel. It's, uh, the OS is freely available to device manufacturers. So where with Apple you see the iOS is specifically, it only runs on their devices. With uh, Android you can run it on multiple types of devices and so you have multiple brands that are available to users. The most common version to note is 4.2, which is Jelly Bean, and the previous version was Ice Cream Sandwich, and I'm not sure why, but all of the names of their code kind of makes me hungry. So device encryption was introduced in, in Ice Cream Sandwich, and it, but it was not just kind of important to note that it was not supported by previous versions, and there are still a good number of people using Gingerbread, and even some using Froyo, so that's something to consider when you're deploying applications, uh, Android applications. Device, devices typically use SD cards for storage and there's currently no encryption support for that for the SD cards and the data is stored on the cards and it can be easily read if, it, if the card itself was lost or stolen. So kind of going back a couple of years, 2.2 uh, Froyo, I think this is probably like 2009 or 10, um, they enabled, uh, the, the, or they added support for locking via PIN or alphanumeric password support. Uh, Google digital uh, signatures are, are not required to run. So as I said with Apple, they actually have an Apple issued certificate and that's not required by Google. Developers, however, can use a self-signed uh, self cert for their applications. And one difference also is that Apple uh, is it's a one user environment, so you can't have multiple accounts. And you, uh, with Android, you can have mul it's a multiple multiple user environment. So in this case, it works very much like Linux, where uh, it assigns a unique uh, UID and GUID for for each account. Has limited VPN support, which is basically limited to PPTP, uh, L2PT, TP, and I IPsec. Um, no support for Cisco IPsec VPNs. And uh, it does support several forms of authentication, just as with uh, the iOS, it does support pre-shared keys and X509 digital certificates. So the way that the application uh, distribution works is uh, there's an Android market, and it's basically an online software store that's available on pretty much every Android device these days. 
And uh, it's important to note that the applications are not audited by Google, so there's no security testing going on with the, with the application itself. It's pretty much up to the developer to do the testing and make sure it's secure before it goes into the store. Uh, and that anonymous, pub anonymous publishing is, is possible. So with Apple, you actually have to have an account, and you have to have that certificate. It's a lot more, uh, there's a lot more scrutiny over the process. The way that you install an app uh, on an Android device is by sideloading it. It's basically an APK file, and you load it on the device, and then your application's installed. And there's not really a simple way for organizations to distribute enterprise applications. So next, I want to, um, well, actually, sorry, one more, one more slide here for Android uh, to just discuss enterprise options here a little bit. Uh, it does support Active, uh, Exchange ActiveSync, has some limited support. It was enabled on Froyo 2.2, and it has a very similar set of, actually identical set of supported policies as iOS did. So next we're going to talk a little bit about BlackBerry. BlackBerry has its own proprietary OS for BlackBerry mobile devices. Uh, there's very limited technical details available for this OS as opposed to Android and iOS. You can find an unbelievable amount of information. That may be because it's a smaller market. Uh, it may be because uh, uh, Research in Motion has, has not really supplied that type of information or made it available to developers. But um, it's basically a third-party application, and it's developed in uh, BlackBerry widgets. It's, it's basically a Java thick client that's running on the BlackBerry devices. And it supports multitasking as with Android and iOS. And it basically operates in a single user mode, very similar to Apple iOS. From a security standpoint, encryption, it supports 256-bit AES encryption. And that's on the device, the SD card, the internal memory. Passcodes can protect hardware, the, the, the hardware encryption key. And it has end-to-end -end encryption for the BlackBerry Enterprise server. And that's a little different than what you've seen with iOS and Android, where an organization can go out and buy this BES enterprise server, and all of their organizations can talk, I mean, all of their devices on that network can talk to that, you know, within that organization, can talk back to that server. And that stores all the organization's data and so forth. So it's a little bit different uh, architecture than iOS and with Android. And for that, it uses triple DES or 256-bit AES, and that's up to the developers to which is, is used. So BlackBerry, the authentication relies on password protected screen lock in order to prevent unauthorized use to the device. And it's alphanumeric password by default. Password protection is not enabled by default and a device is wiped after 10 incorrect uh, attempts to log into the, uh, to the device. Application signing, it uses controlled, AP, to use the controlled APIs app you, you have to have the application signed by Research in Motion, but all other applications do not require a signature. Some examples of some of the controlled APIs are the browser, uh, mail task memo, uh, mailbox operations such as read, writing, and sending, phone event and operations, PDA type of apps such as task, calendar, access, uh, address book, and crypt cryptography app, uh, APIs. So one thing to point out is that the controlled API signing is for tracking. It's not for security at all. It's just for basically saying this is who that, this is the app, this is who, this is who wrote it. Um, Research in Motion never really receives the source code for the application, and they only require a checksum of the source so that they can determine that you know, it hasn't been altered or tampered. It's a $20 application fee, and anonymous sign-up is possible via a prepaid credit card. There's multiple VPN support uh, for this, and it utilizes pre-shared keys for authentication, client certificate, and two-factor authentication, such as RSA, secure IDs. You can also use a smart card to authenticate to the device. As far as uh, authorization goes, there's ser server-side authentication and authorization, but that has to be implemented by the application developer, and that's for use with the BlackBerry Enterprise server. Um, apps can read and write to only certain locations within the device. It's very similar to uh, iOS. Uh, here's an example here of a path that you could write to from your application. 
and there's no file access restrictions between applications. So basically, applications can talk to other application files. It's persistent storage, so data can be stored on flash memory. And uh, the controlled, as I mentioned earlier, the controlled access APIs have to be are, are available for signed applications. So the distribution model for BlackBerry applications is the BlackBerry App World. It's basically an online software store, very similar to Android and iOS. There's no registration fees, and the submitted registrations are reviewed in quotes before being accepted to the app world. There's not really a lot of information as to what happens in that review process or what sort of security testing or lack thereof occurs. So that's something to be aware of. Uh, just like Android, when you install an app on BlackBerry, you sideload it, just like the APK file. And it uses the BES for organizations, uses the BlackBerry Enterprise Server to, to push applications out to devices. So there's three categories of permissions for each application. That's connections, interactions, and user data. Each permission has three settings, and that's allow, prompt, and deny. And that's something that gives the user more control as to uh, does that application have access to certain uh, parts of the application or certain functions on the device. And the application will set permissions after installation, but users can modify those. So if, if you set it to allow and you want to go set it to a not deny or prompt, you, you have the control to do that as a user. So here are some applications that, uh, some settings that are typical on a BlackBerry device. Um, you've got, and this is by default, USB is allow, Bluetooth allow, phone is to prompt, location data is to prompt. Uh, a few that I wanted to kind of point out are that internet is set to allow by default, Bluetooth, USB, and, and device settings are all set to allow by default, so it doesn't necessarily prompt the user or automatically deny access in the beginning from other applications. From an enterprise perspective, uh, it's a centralized link between devices and the corporate network using the, the BES model. It supports more than 450 IT policy rules which is you know, definitely beneficial for a large organization that wants to have a good bit of control over policies for all of their users and the devices. Uh, that's over the air privacy uh, policy enforcement. End-to-end -end encryption between all the de devices and the, the back-end BES server. And, and that's great for emails, messaging, collaboration services, and the mobile data systems communication. So kind of to recap, uh, I put together this diagram here that sort of lays out where the security is better in certain OSs. And they're all not bad, but iOS is sort of leading. Um, but the, the, I'd say the Android and B and, and BlackBerry are not too far behind. The, the green area is the, the strongest part of security, the red being security not available at all. And as far as um, from, a, this is kind of to continue the last screen, I'll go back here. The first line there, device authentication, device encryption, um, app, app, application sandbox, application permissions, application signing. And then on the next page here, the policy enforcement uh, is not something that you can do with Android. Same with remote wipe and VPN. And then um, device two-factor is something that's still missing from iOS and Android. And then restricting third-party apps is not possible with Android. So let's talk a little bit about threat vectors. Um, mobile applications are a lot, they have a, a very similar security aspects to a thick client or a web application. Um, it's basically, think of it as a thick client that's stored in your pocket versus you know, a web application that's just running and you can access it via a browser or whatnot. Um, the threat model process is basically, if you're, if you're going to take a look at your, at your mobile application and you want to make sure that you're protected, you want to diagram the overall application architecture, see where the data flows, see where the data is stored, um, look at where, you know, how is the data secured at rest, how is it secured in transit, uh, who has access to it, what are the number of roles. So you want to look at the overall architecture of what's involved and how many components are uh, required for your application itself. You can use a frame like Stride or CIA to prevent potential threats. And you can document, you know, the rate of the th the rate of the threats. So the Stride method, I'll, I'll go through this, through this kind of quick here. Uh, you basically Stride breaks down to spoofing, tampering, repudiation, information disclosure, denial of service, and elevation of privilege. 
And these all tie into authentication, integrity, non-repudiation, confidential, confidentiality, and availability and authorization as far as what the risk is. Another great resource when you're looking at mobile threats is to leverage the OWASP. They have a mobile top 10 now. Uh, there are some similarities to the, app, the, the standard application top 10, but just to go through these quickly, you have insecure data storage, weak server-side controls, insufficient transportation layer protection, client-side injection, poor authorization and authentication, improper session handling, secure decisions via untrusted inputs, secure channel data leakage, broken cryptography, and sensitive information disclosure. So here's a generic mobile app architecture. I mentioned earlier you want to diagram uh, the overlay of, or sort of the, the layout of, of what talks to your application and, and where's your data going. So in this case, we have the device here in the center, and it talks to a number of things. Um, we've got third-party web servers. We have an application web service. We have a cell tower and a, and a Wi-Fi or a Wi-Fi access point. We've got the user itself. We've got uh, device and application backups that may be stored on your local system when you plug it in. And then you've got device storage and external storage, maybe on an SD card. And this is just kind of a generic model. You may, or you may have some more of these, and you may, you may not have all of these in your application architecture. So just to kind of outline some of the things, and I'm not picking on anyone specific, but these are just kind of some headlines here uh, where City had, they, they basically disclosed, uh, had a disclosed security flaw in their iPhone app and what it was doing was it was storing sensitive data locally on the device in an unencrypted manner and so when that was backed up it was also storing it when, you know, in backups in, in plain text as well. So this has all been fixed but this is something that kind of came out in the news a while back. just want to point out that I, I guess no organization wants to end up on the front of a, you know, be a headline uh, because of a security flaw such as this. Uh, there were also Wells Fargo and Bank of America, app Bank of America applications. These have since been cleaned up, but they were insecurely storing uh, sensitive data on their application. This included login credentials, app uh, account numbers, balance transfer information. Um, it was reported to the media just a couple days after disclosing it to the vendor, and you know, like I said, no organization really enjoys bad press. So next, I'm going to go through um, a, another demo, but I just want to talk a little bit about what this is here. Uh, it, it's something called iOS Backup Extractor, and what it does is it allows me to extract the data from the local backup that iTunes does on iOS. It, it backs up your local device, and I can use this tool right here to extract that data out, and then we can go in and read some. And so I'm going to show you a demo of how this works. And this is a freely available tool. Okay, so in this case, we're on a Windows system here, and we're going to run this iPhone backup extractor, executable. And it's basically, you can go here and you can find a recent backup that you did on the device. You select it in the drop down. It's got some basic information that's available uh, within the backup itself. So we're going to um, select something specific to extract from it. Anyone play Words with Friends? We're familiar with that app, so we're going to kind of pick on them and see what kind of data may be stored in their local SQLite database. So we're going to extract that to uh, just our local hard drive here. So everything gets restored. So 
So we've got the, uh, this looks interesting right here, the chess database SQLite file. So we're going to take a look at that in a SQLite database viewer. So here's the data here in the device, and we're going to take a look at the tables here. And we're going to take a look at the user table. And we're going to go out, and we only have one record. This is our one user that we have here. And we want to, first of all, point out, here's our email address that's stored in clear text here on the device. And then we have an encoded authentication, which looks like the password. So we're basically just going to take that password there, pull it out. We're going to load it into Burp Decoder here. And there we go. You can take a look here. I'm going to pause it so you can kind of take a look. And you can see it basically in that, in that string there, it's storing the uh, password, which is this is my demo password and the username. So you could basically take this information and go log into Words with Friends with someone else's account. So a couple other examples here. And I don't have demos for these, but I just want to kind of go through a couple other applications that are available that um, I'll get to them in a minute, but they, they may appear to be valid applications, but they uh, were written and they have malware or they have other intentions than, you know, to be a flashlight or something like that. So uh, Android does not provide native backup solution. So backups are... Backup applications can be installed. There's a couple different applications. There's a couple different backup solutions, such as Astro File Manager. Um, there's other tools that you can use uh, for backing up to an SD card. Uh, and even though there's no native, no native backup, there's still you know a considered a potential uh, for information disclosure threat. For BlackBerry, there's uh, IPD Dump, which is an open source project. It's basically a utility which extracts records from the unencrypted BlackBerry backups. So I mentioned a couple um, malicious applications. Here's one here. Um, it's called Handy Light for iOS. And this one's interesting. Uh, most people would just download this so that, you know, when they're trying to fumble into bed at night, they can, um, you know, use this as a flashlight, plug in their phone, and so forth. So it's disguised to be a flashlight application, but in reality, um, it's access forbidden APIs. Uh, it allows device to enable tethering with a PC. It managed to be, somehow managed to be accepted in the, in the App Store, and it was eventually removed by Apple. But this is kind of one to point out here that, that it is possible to, to get malicious applications with malicious intent into the application store. Here's one for Android. It's basically there's some fraudulent banking applications. And this application here was sort of an all-in-one finance app, which you could log into multiple, app, uh, multiple types of uh, financial institutions, banks, uh, investment firms, and so forth. And it basically would take your data and steal your login credentials and port them off back to, to a back-end server. Um, Google noticed this, and the application was removed from the, from the App Store. So there's also Android malware attacks, which is the SW Secure Phone. What the app did was basically monitor messages, call logs, location, images, recorded sounds around the phone, and it would upload those to a remote server every 20 seconds. And then there's the Droid Dream which um, basically exploited a, a kernel vulnerability uh, in order to gain root privileges on the device. And it gathers data, uh, device information and uploads that to a remote server. And over 50 applications were found to contain this actual malware. There's TSX BB Spy, which uh, it's a, it was basically a proof of concept application to demonstrate that spyware capabilities uh, could be used to, in the BlackBerry API or leverage the API, the BlackBerry API. It demonstrates the ability to dump out the contacts and messages, capture SMS messages, monitor phone usage and GPS data, 
And uh, the applications are signed, not audited, as I mentioned earlier, so that's something to keep in, keep in mind. And once installed, it's pretty much trivial to, to steal the data. So from a jailbreaking standpoint, um, it basically, what is jailbreaking and rooting? It basically exploits a vulnerability or privilege escalation vulnerability on the device itself, and it's used to circumvent the OS security restrictions, such as code signing, file and resource permissions, and application permissions. And at that point, once it's jailbroken, it's pretty much uh, fair game for any, any application can be installed on it, uh, and so you're not, so you're basically, you're not protected by someone like Apple that's, that's actually signing these applications before they get installed on your device. You're, you're pretty much on your own at that point. A couple tools, there are a number of them out there, but a couple of them that, that kind of came to mind are uh, Evasion and Red Snow for iOS. And um, they're both tethered jailbreaks. And you can basically uh, download the app and then just connect the device. And these work on the later versions of of iOS 6.12 and 6.1. For Android, there are a large number of, of rooting devices or rooting scripts and apps available, but Universal Android, Android Z4, um, basically the user installs the APA, APK file on the device itself, and then um, the rooting is via a connected Android device, super one click or unrevoked, and it typically exploits a Linux security vulnerability in the kernel. And as I said, there's, there's no shortage of Android rooting mechanisms. So I kind of wanted to do a little recap on the threat modeling itself. As I mentioned, um, it's, it's a great idea to look at the architecture of your application itself and what it connects to and so forth to look at the type of data that it stores, to look at the type of data that it transmits. Um, the OS security features can only really help mitigate some of the risks, so to a degree it's up to the developer to make sure that they're using the best security practices and coding practices available. Um, and unfortunately devices will not always be using these features, so it's kind of up to the user, for example, to set a passcode or a strong passcode on the device. So that's something the developers don't really have control over. So um, there are security mechanisms that we can leverage, and in those that we can, we should. Uh, should implement device management for policy enforcement and secure distribution of applications for large organizations or for organizations in general. And then harden and limit access to server-side resources consumed by the mobile clients. And that's becoming more and more uh, prevalent these days. Pretty much every app connects back to some sort of remote server. So from a secured coding practices standpoint, you can mitigate um, you know, the following threats. Unlocked device, offline file system attacks, unencrypted backups, malicious applications, application reverse engineering, client input validation flaws, such as buffer overflows, SQL injection, and so forth, and security vulnerabilities on a web service. I'm going to talk briefly about securing devices and apps and, and ways that you can do that. And the first one is to enforce password policy. So you want to make sure you have a strong and complex password policy, uh, limit the number of retries, and have a grace period before the device actually locks. Uh, enable remote or have the, basically the functionality for remote lock and wiping. Restrict third party applications and require a VPN, if possible, whenever accessing organization data via web services or sites. Some application development tips. Sensitive data in transit should be secured over, or sent over a secure channel, such as uh, SSL. If sensitive data must be stored on the device, uh, encrypt the data at rest using a platform uh, encryption, such as the keychain for iOS, mask sensitive information such as password fields so that that prevents shoulder surfing. Authentication must be equivalent to a corresponding web application. Validate input server side or if received from an external source. So basically trust no one other, you know, tr trust no one outside of yourself. 
handle sensitive data carefully to avoid inadvertent leakage. So that goes for third-party services, um, IPC URL handlers, pasteboard, email, et cetera. And that's pretty much it. I just wanted to kind of note a couple resources that were used when we put together this uh, presentation here. And that's it. Are there any questions? Yes? Okay, thank you. I don't have a BlackBerry device, and some of the data was in, uh, limited, so QNX. Okay, I'll update my slides. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, sir. This one, the, the SW uh, phone was, it's gone. You can't get it anymore. You can't leverage it anymore, but that was probably three years ago. Um, at the time, the, restate your question as far as what you could do with it. Is that what you said? What? Yeah, uh, you just had a slide there. Yeah, let me go back to that one. Mm -hmm. Here we go. Yeah. Modern messages, call logs. So. At the time, it bypassed it because that was allowed by default, and that's since been changed, and this application has been removed as well. So you can't even get this in anymore. This is, these are just some examples. And some of these examples are when, when the marketplaces were originally introduced. There still are some that you, know, you, still, you see from time to time, but they are far further and few between, fewer between. <laughs> Any other questions? Yes, sir. Uh, you can use R RSA Secure ID. Yeah, the USB keys are not supported for, for iOS. I did hear that fingerprinting is coming with the next version, so we'll probably know on Monday about that. But I've, I've heard, is that what you're speaking of the rumor for that? Yeah, I, I saw that as well. So I, as of now, there's not an external device uh, authentication mechanism. Yes? If we turn on the encryption feature of the iTunes or backups, how secure is that? The encryption itself? It's, yeah. I believe it's 256-bit AES. That's locally on the device, so if you yeah. encrypt it, same as it would be on the device itself. Yeah, so you're good as long as you... The, the, the one thing I wanted to point out with that is that you have to check that box. And most people are not going to check that box. We as security-minded people probably will. I do, but my mom doesn't. So. Oh, one thing I wanted to point out is if you have, uh, if you have an enterprise managed device, uh, iOS device, mm -hmm. um, you can put a managed device on there and it has an encryption key and the device encryption. So they can do the remote. Oh, exactly. That's a really good point. She says, just to restate what you, what you said, is that if you have an enterprise model or enterprise management system set up for iOS, the enterprise itself has part of that, the, you know, the other symmetric key, and that's how they do remote wipe. They can remove the key and rem they can remote wipe it from, from afar. So if the device gets lost, which is, is, is common, um, I think, you know, a number of years ago, the was it, I, was it the uh, iPhone 4 got leaked and you know, they did like a remote wipe on that thing so, they, so no one could figure out what it was. Um, Gizmodo did, but, but uh, that was interesting. Yes, sir. Very interesting. So uh, how do they restrict it at the organization level? Um, is it based on the organization's name or? Uh, I work for UNC Charlotte. Uh -huh. And so UNC Charlotte got issued one enterprise level key, and athletics got it. So now we got the coordinate with Pender. We kind of want to push out an app. Uh, we actually use a like, Casper for a local management suite. Mm -hmm. So we can push out internal applications that way. 
Okay. We have our little app store called self-service. Mm-hmm. That's how we get around it, and we can do our own sign-in and things like that, and testing it out. So if you want to do the app store, you have to go through whoever the <laughs> All right, well, thanks so much for your time. Really appreciate it. Most enterprises today realize that usernames and passwords alone aren't enough to keep their network safe from unauthorized intrusions. That's why two-factor authentication has gotten so popular lately. It adds that extra layer of protection enterprise networks need to stay safe. But what you may not know is that some two-factor authentication solutions, they're better than others, like two-factor strong authentication with Wicked. Wicked goes beyond other authentication systems by being less expensive, easier to implement, and easier to use, giving you software-based token clients built to run on all major devices and OSs, including iOS and Android. These tokens utilize a public-private key combination that's generated on device, so there aren't any shared secrets flying around for attackers to hijack, or which require any special handling. Instead, all keys are kept secure and private between the requesting token and your server, which you control in-house, making it the most secure way possible to perform authentication encryption. And with an extensive, flexible API and support for protocols like LDAP and RADIUS, Wicked works with any enterprise network architecture to protect the IT systems vital to your enterprise. Download your Wicked free trial today. Regardless of whether you're considering two-factor authentication for the first time, or just ready to ditch your existing expensive key fob system, we can help with easy-to-implement, easy-to-use, strong authentication from Wicked. Customers rely on your website or application. If it's slow or non-responsive, it infuriates your users and costs you money. Keeping your business-critical systems humming along requires insight into what they're doing. Your system metrics tell stories, stories that can reveal performance bottlenecks, resource limitations, and other problems. But how do you keep an eye on all of your system's performance metrics in real time and record this data for later analysis? Enter Longview, the new way to see what's really going on under the hood. The Longview dashboard lets you visualize the status of all your systems, providing you with a bird's eye view of your entire fleet. You can sort by CPU, memory, swap, processes load, and network usage. Click a specific system to access its individual dashboard, then click and drag to zoom in on choke points and get more detail. Comprehensive network data, including inbound and outbound traffic, is available on the Network tab, and Disk Writes and Free Space on the Disks tab, while the Process Explorer displays usage statistics for individual processes. The System Info tab shows listening services, active connections, and available updates. Adding Longview to a system is easy. Just click the button, copy the one-line installation command, then run the command on your Linux system to complete the process. The agent will begin collecting data and sending it to Longview. Then the graphs start rolling. Use Longview to gain visibility into your servers, so when your website or app heats up, it stays up. When we created Asterisk over a decade ago, we could not have imagined that Asterisk would not only become the most widely adopted open source communication software on the planet, but that it would impact the entire industry in the way that it has. Today, Asterisk has found its way into more than 170 countries and virtually every Fortune 1000 company. The success of Asterisk has enabled a transition of power from the hands of the traditional proprietary phone vendors 
into the hands of the users and the administrators of phone systems. Using this power, our customers have created all sorts of business changing applications, from small office phone systems to mission critical call centers to international carrier networks. In fact, there's even an entire country whose communications infrastructure runs on asterisks. Digium has always been about creating technology that expands communications capabilities in ways that we could never have imagined. And that's part of what's game changing about Digium. Today, we're doing it again, this time by introducing a new family of HDIP phones that extends control of the user all the way to the desktop. The launch of these new products represents the next phase in Digium's history of innovation. These are the first and only IP phones designed to fully leverage the power of Asterisk. When we first discussed our expectations for building a family of phones for use with Asterisk, our requirements were pretty simple. We asked the team to build the phones such that they were easy to install, integrate, provision, and use. I think you'll soon agree our engineers have delivered on that goal. User feedback is validating that when it comes to operation with Asterisk-based systems, including our own SwitchFox-based product, these are the easiest to use, best integrated, most interoperable products on the market today. The Digium family of phones will initially include three IP desk phones, uniquely designed to complement any Asterisk or SwitchFox-based solution. These phones are different for a number of reasons. First, they're exclusively designed for use with Asterisk. Secondly, we've made it really easy to auto-discover and provision the phones. Next, we've made it easy for the phones to access information inside of Asterisk, allowing tight coupling between an application and the phone. Additionally, we've created an applications engine that allows users and developers to create and run their own apps on the phone. And finally, we've done all of this at a very compelling price point. At Digium, we're always thinking of ways to give our customers the best value in business phone systems and also give them the power to create their own solutions for any communications challenge. We'll continue to push the boundaries, not only to make Asterisk cooler and faster and more technologically feature rich, but to make Asterisk and VoIP communications even easier. And together, we'll change the way the world communicates. Again. Cloud stacks are everywhere. This is the way to, to better utilize uh, all your resources and it makes managing all your resources pretty easy. All of the innovation is happening in open source. The, the collaborative nature and of the uh, you know of the community and, and the speed at which these uh, these you know these these deficiencies these bugs are getting discovered and then fixed is a uh, thing that really shows the power of the you know of the open source community. It is global, and it's definitely because of the users. Community people are extremely friendly and uh, always ready to help. If you go on to IRC any day, you'll see these guys helping each other out and they're all doing it like in a selfless manner. The product is transparent for everyone. Everyone can look at the code base. Um, everyone can see how CloudStack is, is being built. Nothing, nothing is proprietary. Everything is open. In many ways, it's absolutely vital to the, to the ongoing health of CloudStack. The most exciting event uh, in recent memory for me uh, was our first developer boot camp. Uh, and you know, our call gave people, I think, maybe two weeks notice to come attend. I was expecting 25 or, or 30 people. Uh, so we ended up with uh, 87 people. Uh, and had to go get more chairs uh, into the room twice. Everything within cloud computing is commodity and is open source. And so I, I don't think that you will, uh, you, you'll see anywhere where open source is not pervasive in cloud computing. And so I, I, think it's, uh, I think it's an assumption. I think when you talk about cloud computing, you're really talking about open source cloud computing. CloudStack is a robust solution for large deployments. You have dozens of data centers and thousands of servers in each data center. Uh, these um, uh, hardware is going to fail, and CloudStack is designed to handle number one that mass scale. Number two, it's designed to handle the failure that inevitably happens uh, in large deployments. We started working on CloudStack over four years ago, uh, and you know it was the original set of people working on it. 
uh, had a background of delivering software to telcos and service providers. Lots of QA, lots of users actually using it. High availability is a key feature. Uh, multiple hypervisor support. Uh, different network models. You can pick up whatever suits you better. Well, stack management server can be deployed in different physical machines. It definitely has a huge footprint. It's being deployed everywhere. There's a major movie studio that uh, um, they were using CloudStack. They were using it to transcode video. And I thought that was terribly fascinating. What I found more fascinating is what they did during lunch, where they would spin up uh, you know, 50 or 60 game servers. And then as soon as lunch was over, they would destroy all the instances and go back to doing real work. CloudStack is vast. Uh, it touches so many different aspects, and there's no one person that's kind of like a master of all those realms. I think Cloud Stack as a project is going to be uh, one of the leaders simply because it's some of the most featureful and, and, uh, and robust platforms out there. I don't see any limits to the Cloud Stack.